Greetings, everybody. Welcome to Jerry's Live. As always, I'm your host, Amy Gardner-Dean. Today, we've got episode JL123. It's drawing lesson number four, if you've been following along with our drawing lessons. It's about the intricacies of shading, which is something that can really not so much make or break a drawing, but if you're trying to look really realistic and highly technical, it's really a good skill to have multiple different types of techniques of shading in your repertoire as an artist to really give that three-dimensional look and make your drawings pop. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. If you're interested in seeing any of the supplies that we're using on this show, you're just going to go to the jerrysartorama.com website, type in the search box JL123, that's JL123, which we all for some reason had lots of jokes about today. Um, it's like it should be brought by the letter C or something like that, right? Sponsored by the letter C like Sesame Street. So uh, you'll type in JL123 and that will pop up the supply list so you can see all the items that we're using today. So let's talk about drawing and shading. Um, so drawing skills, we've gone over those just to give you some good basic drawing skills. A lot of people have been doing their homework in our Jerry's live um, Facebook group and posting it. And that's really cool to see and I appreciate that. I'm not sure who else is out there practicing from our drawing lessons, but hopefully you are because it only makes you better the more you do it. So shading is really a technique that creates the illusion of light on an object or a scene in your drawing, right? It helps give that illusion of dimension and depth when you decide where your light source is going to be, whether it's in a reference photo maybe that you've got or from several references that you're putting together, you're gonna to need to select a single light source and then use that to actually help kind of model the shading to give that three-dimensional capability to your drawing. When we talk about shading, we're talking about value and contrast. And although those pretty much work hand in hand, they're kind of two different things. Value and contrast are almost like a push and pull, if you will, that gives your object or your, your subject matter, I guess for better lack of a term, visual life. Um, value is the darkness or lightness of a color or a gray tone. Since we're doing drawing, obviously we're talking about gray tone. So value is you've got your super dark dark, then in those steps all the way to the lightest white so that you've got kind of almost between black and white, all those kind of gray range in there in between. When we refer to value, that's what we're talking about. That's considered value. Okay, contrast is differences, whether they're subtle or whether they're in your face. Think about when you've got, um, you see a sign and it's a black sign and it's super thick, chunky, white block printing. That is stark contrast, right? That white on black and also that kind of big chunky lettering, it grabs your attention. That is high contrast. Um, in this, we're talking about the differences of contrast in value. Uh, whether you make those subtle or extreme, you can be pushed a little bit further than what you actually see and you're trying to represent to make it more dramatic to the eye. Like if you've got a drawing and you've got a subject matter and it's lit very dramatically, even though maybe it's a light item and the background isn't completely black, you may want to change that and make it black to really make that object stand out. That's considered high contrast, okay? You have artistic license. That's the beauty of being an artist. Just because a photo that you've got or several images that you have that you're putting together don't have a certain look, you have the right to actually make it look how you want. And when you've got those tools of kind of knowledge of things like contrast, that's how you can kind of use those tools to your advantage. Okay, so we're going to look at a subject matter. I just went on Pixabay, found something that was very simple. It's an egg. Um, seems like always an easy thing to do. An egg or a sphere, right? Or a, or a ball. It seems like the things we all have done in some class or another. Um, so we've got this sphere, if you can zoom in on that for us, Katie. It doesn't want to lay down because it's bendy. Okay, 
Can we see? Oh yeah, that's good. All right. So when we're looking at this, light determines the values that we see here, okay? So where we've got a stronger contrast and an intensity here, we've got a lot of light directly on our subject matter, this little egg. And then we've got some kind of here, we've got a nice little reflective light source here where this is bounced up and kind of is bouncing off the bottom of that egg and really lighting that up almost more so, and back here almost more so than the actual object itself. Um, you can take light and make it softer, more muted, a more gradual contrast. This would be probably considered pretty high contrast because this is very white with these very black backgrounds. And even though this is probably a little lighter here than here, this seems brighter just kind of to me because of that stark contrast, the very dark background shadow of the egg against that lightness. All right. So when we talk about different things, uh, this, these are just going to be kind of technical terms that I want you to kind of be aware of so that as we're talking, it maybe makes a little bit more sense. Obviously, this is the highlight here, right? Our light source is directed kind of at this angle because it's throwing that shadow this way. Mid-range. Mid-range is kind of that mid-tone that's kind of the average maybe in here, kind of where it starts graying out. Uh, depending on your lighting source, if it's not, this is a lot more dramatic at the side light. If it was kind of like this, maybe there would be a, that shadow would shift. There would be kind of that darker mid-tone in here. It's kind of here because of that egg shape that's a little bit longer oval. And then kind of that mid-range right there as it starts going into those darks. So when I talk about mid-range, that's what we're going to be talking about. The core shadow. The core shadow is are kind of darker darks right in here, okay? That is your core shadow. Reflected highlight is this little spot here where the lights bounce down on the white, bouncing off that egg. You can see that that's a really, really light white there. That is gonna be your reflected highlight. Sometimes something will be lit. You can see a little bit of a reflected highlight here as well. Sometimes if the angle is where it's turned more like this, it will be actually under the whole object and you'll see it in the back. So start looking at objects just sitting around your house and kind of thinking of those terms and saying, oh, look, there's that reflected highlight when the lamp is, I know that sounds dorky for you to kind of look at me like, uh-huh. No, I was just thinking about all the fun you can have with light sources and glass. Yes. Oh yeah, exactly. And that something for next week that we'll talk about that at the end there will be glass and light sources so all right so then we've got this big area here cast shadow our object is casting this lovely shadow the light is not getting through so we've got that nice shadow there um so if i talk about a cast shadow that's what we're going to be discussing uh the location of the value areas tell you where the light source is and that intensity. And the cast shadow is kind of, your, if you're not sure overall, this, this is pretty obvious on this one, but if you're not sure, always look at where the shadow is. If the shadow is more up under the object, the light source is more directly from above or slightly to kind of the left or right of it. If it's longer like this, it's obviously coming from an angle there. Okay? So, shading techniques. Drawing medium is actually going to dictate some of these. As, as strange as that might sound as we discuss this, maybe it'll make a little bit more sense. Um, ink pens clearly are going to limit your shading capabilities to linear work like cross hatching or hatching or stippling, or also known as pointillism. It, you, you think of all those, uh, we've got somebody in the group, I can't think of, of the gentleman's name right off the top of my head, does a lot of pointillism work with the ink pen. Very nice stuff. There's been a couple cars and some things like that. You're kind of limiting yourself when you're using a pen to that because that works really well for that. You obviously aren't going to be shading and, and using a tool that, for blending and things like that with that ink pen because it creates a direct line, okay? Um, pencils are actually uh, the most versatile due to the fine point on them. Um, you can use them for line work, you can use them for pointillism, as long as they're not too hard because they won't leave you. You want to use your softer B pencils for um, pointillism or stippling. 
Um, they also work great for burnishing because that graphite kind of leaves that smooth surface that can be moved around and played with. Um, and then charcoal is probably the second most easy to do a majority of these type of techniques. Stippling, I guess you could if it's a very hard charcoal pencil and you kept it really sharp and you were very patient and not heavy handed. So that's just kind of the, the reason why I'm saying this. Obviously, if it's an oil-based pencil, not gonna be able to blend super easy unless you introduce solvent and things like that. We're just using graphite today. So I'm just discussing more uh, what those uh, shading techniques can do for specific medium. All right, so cross-hatching and hatching. We talk about differences. It's got hatching in both of them, right? Any idea, ladies? I'm gonna put you on the spot since I can't grab a viewer because of the delay. What the difference between cross hatching and just hatching is? Is one in the shape of a cross? <laughs> That's actually probably not the worst theory behind it. Not necessarily a cross, but it's lines that, that intersect, intersect with each other. No matter what the angle is that you're bringing in, whether you're just turning just a minute kind of instance off and doing that, the hatching, it's got to cross. Hatching is actually where the lines are running just parallel with the line that you've already put down and what you're doing to darken it to attain your value is either putting more lines over it, you can actually make lines wider in areas you want darker and skinnier in areas you don't. That one's actually the trick that takes a lot of good practice. So we'll talk about that in a minute. I think cross hatching is something that probably more people know of, but feel less comfortable with. So I've got this, the, our egg here, and I think, what? what? Patty said hatching is what the egg does. Patty. <laughs> Not wrong. <laughs> I guess, Patty. So, so would that be like which came first, the hatching or the cross hatching, right? Oh, Patty. <laughs> It's a good thing you're from Wisconsin. I'm going to forgive it this time. All right, I'm going to use a 4B just because we all know it's so hard to see. I, we can luckily see this pretty well. I didn't want it to be too heavy, but... All right, so with hatching uh, or cross-hatching, I would go in first. I like to determine kind of where my darker darks are first to kind of decide how dark I want to make the rest of it. So we can see those lines, right? Kind of well enough. So that's my one line that I'm going in with. Then I would come across. Yeah, because I've got to um, lean over at kind of a precarious angle here. I can't. I would normally pick my hand up doing this and have it be loose, but I am afraid that I'll lose my balance. So. Can everybody see that? Or do we need to get in closer or is it pretty obvious? And the more these intersect, obviously the frequency is going to be uh, what determines your value, right? So obviously out here, I've just got one set of lines, right? That's much lighter than in here where I'm going in and I've got multiple kind of overlays that are darkening that up. Now, some people will only make it, you know, specifically square to each other. Some people have a kind of a theory, or I guess not a theory. Uh, every so often they switch to this angle and to this angle. Sometimes if, if I'm doing pen work, I'll actually move the paper around so that the place that I'm most comfortable in always has the hatching going that specific way. And then I'll just turn it to do the next series across and I'll turn it to do the next series across. But that's not always the case. And sometimes... With hatching, uh, this is the cross hatching, but with hatching, we'll show in a minute, it actually helps some if they're drawn as a contour line, like this is an egg. So if you contour around it with the line, that helps kind of the brain of the viewer see that um, dimension. Yes, Frida. Does it matter where you start the hatching line? Absolutely not. It does not matter where you start the hatching line. I just, I, for, I like my darks for some reason, and so I will typically. So 
So you could start in the middle of the shadow and bring the line out towards the egg? You could, yes, you could do it any which way. I like grounding that first so then I can see, but that's, it's just a matter of personal preference. There's no right or wrong in how this is done. That's, that's a good question because there's some people that think that there's got to be an automatic. It, it, you're, it's more important if you're drawing to actually draw kind of the whole shape rather than focus on one part and then kind of add on things from there because it's a good way for you to keep kind of the perspective of everything in how it compares to each other shape and size wise. For shading, it's not as important. I think the, the one thing that I've found that's important is I will go in and like with this, I would probably go even a little bit darker. I always find my darkest dark and see kind of where I want that to be and how dark I want that. So then everything else I can look at it in comparison to this is almost as dark right here at the tip. Did I make that as dark as this? Nope, this is lighter. Well, I need to go up there and then I need to, to fix that, if that makes any sense. Just just so that we've got that, um, that contrast kind of easier to spot and kind of balance out. Can everybody see how I'm kind of just going to that edge? I'm not going all the way in there because there is a little reflected highlight coming along that base of the egg. So I'm already gonna leave that. I could go back in with an eraser and kind of pull that out, but it'll smear the edge of those lines. So I'm just leaving that there. Now there's one thing that you need to be very aware of as you're working with lines, with hatching. You want to sharpen constantly, especially with this, I'm using a 4B. I would never at this point ever use anything. I'd probably be using a 2B at the most. Um, until I kind of decided where I wanted my darkest darks and how dark they were. And then I would go back in with a softer pencil because this paper's got a little bit of tooth to it and it really starts um, wearing the soft lead pretty easily. So the lines get thicker and softer and wider and I don't like that. I like very crisp lines for my hatching. So. Um, so if I was using this to do a drawing, uh, one of my own drawings, I would be constantly sharpening it just so it's nice and crisp and dark. Shannon on YouTube wants to know, is shading done more with the tip or the side of the pencil? I imagine that depends on the technique that you're using. It, it, Shannon, it depends on the technique and we're going to talk about some other techniques in a little bit. With any linear work like this, you really want it to be the tip of the pencil and you want to keep it nice and sharp so that you keep those, because what's, what's going to happen is if I don't keep this nice and sharp and crisp and I'm not using the tip, you're going to be able to start seeing, um, and I can see it now from where I am, but I'm also a line control freak about this kind of stuff. I can see that some of my lines, I let the pencil go too long before I sharpened it and they're thicker than other lines, and that bugs me to no end. So you would want to, for this type of, of technique, you want this to be the tip, maybe the side, but it still needs to be very sharp so that it functions almost like the tip for this. So is everybody kind of getting the gist of cross-hatching? You, you want it with this type of a thing, like this, you could kind of go along the contour of the egg. I could only do some kind of like angular this way and then come back and do some very, you know, kind of going up in more of like that kind of graphic novel, harder line type of thing. But, but I know with this type of a technique, I can control the lines pretty well where, where even, even once it's done, it'll look soft and you'll see the lines, but you kind of, don't read them as lines when you're viewing it, if that makes any sense. I feel like I should say drink every time I say that. It's the Amy drinking game. All right, has everybody got a handle on this? Are we good to go to the next? I think so. The next one? Okay. All right, so if we're looking here, 
we can see kind of the start of that. Darkest darks right here, that would, that would be, I'm gonna do this so you can just see. That would be out like that. And then this would be getting darker up in here as I went up, okay? Fun fact about Amy, I do this usually from right to left. And so this is like, yes, being left-handed and in being in classes with charcoal and um, pencil for illustration classes, you want to be really, really, like I, my first couple drawings looked like smear, 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 yeah. smear. Oh, look, this is so pretty right here. And then just this horrible smear. So, and the eraser technology wasn't what it was today. So trying to get that off with a pink pearl eraser was not <laughs> handy. I don't think I even had, they had stick erasers then. So that I learned to go from right to left to complete a work so as not to drag my hand through it. Does the line direction make a difference when you're cross hatching or hatching? No. Unless, okay, it does for hatching. Not cr cross hatching, you can kind of hide it in the intricacies of, and, and with this, I could have done like darker hatching. With pressure, you can really control how deep a line is that you're leaving with your pencil, right? So I could control that and make that darker a lot faster if I wanted, but I like bringing it up from lighter to darker and making it a little more kind of a softer gradient. Okay, so here's our hatching where it's just the lines are drawn in the same direction, okay? So the closer those lines are together, the darker the values, the further away they are, the lighter the values. All right, so with this, since the shadow goes at this angle, I would probably make my shadow, and I'm gonna kind of overlap the egg because I'll, I would do the shadow first on this because this is a little harder to control. And then I would come back in and erase that before I started the next one. And with this, I start the line and then I kind of continue on. See how it already looks like you really can't see the line as much. Now with more pressure, if you see, if I put more pressure on, you can see a much darker line. I could really put a lot more pressure on. I just don't like how soft that looks and see how this is already, even though there's still some point to it, it's already to a point of where I don't like how soft it's gotten. So I'm gonna sharpen it. And then it's softer up here because I don't have the double kind of double down, down line. So I very gently, as I place it down, not pushing hard and then pushing harder through the stroke to kind of balance that darkness out that's missing. Can everybody see that? Is it picking up all right on the monitor, Katie? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, oh. it shows up better on these than that okay. one, the one you can see. Okay, so go under here and get this. So we'll be able to. Do you have any helpful hints for not smudging work? and or storing work until you get back to it again without it smudging uh with that if leave it in the pad um get some glassine paper to put between it or like a nice piece something that's archival right so it's not damaging your your paper and that's not going to pick up the imprint you can use workable fixative but I can tell when there's workable fixative on paper and I don't like the feel of it and I don't think that it lays down the lines as well. So I tend to not put workable fixative on until I'm a lot closer to either being done or a lot closer where I know that it's just little touches that I've got left to do. Um, smudging it, uh, we've shown the artist leaning bridge on multiple shows. All right, see now I'm gonna come in with this just kind of tidy that up. Um, it's, it's a little kind of plastic thing with feet that you can lean your hand on. I use those a lot. And then I've also been known to, um, I've got a hockey brush that's, that's not the same as this. That's an old style. I haven't seen one in forever. Um, that's wider and it's, it's kind of made with round reeds that are sewn together and it sits up high. And I've always put my hand on that and then 
I can just swipe the crumbs off the page with the brush. So it's from the eraser or pencil. So it's kind of like a handy little two in one, but it, the same, the same token, even though it's not advised and instructors will want to pop you for it. I work from being left-handed right to left. So you could always do left to right as you're starting the shading, not the regular drawing, but just to kind of control a little bit of the smudging or even just a piece of paper you can lay over it as long as you don't slide the paper around. Bridge. Yep, well, that's what, what I said at the beginning. That would be the preferable thing because then you can see your drawing through it. Mm -hmm. You can see your shading, you know, through it from there. Okay, so that looks, it's reading as kind of a solid unit. I would be going back in here and like this would be about how dark I would want this to be, to be happy with it. Okay, see how much darker that is there? So I would do that all on that, but I wanna show you kind of how and where, kind of rounding out this. You could do one of two things. Since the, the shadow is kind of almost a, a vertical this way, you could kind of round your strokes around that shape that way. You could try to contour around it. You better have a really steady hand and be really good at it. Um, or you could even do, if you could stick with the same line that you're doing through the whole thing so that it kind of reads as one style. If you're not real good at controlling this, it might be better to practice this technique with everything going the same way and getting used to kind of keeping your line straight than suddenly turn it this way because if any of those little lines get off, it's going to be very obvious. So I'm going to opt to just go the same way I'm going to start up here where the, I'm going to do this since I've already done that down there. Now I'm paranoid that I can't. How do you personally decide whether you're going to hatch or cross hatch? Um, okay. It depends. And that's a good question. And I brought a couple examples where I've done both. Okay. Um, we'll just show these now while I'm thinking about it. Okay, so this, Katie, oh yeah, you can see that. I don't know if you can see the cross hatching though. It's, it's colored ink. So this is a drawing that's done with ink pens specifically. So there's no erasing and there's color. So it looks like paint, but it's actually it's cross hatching. Can zoom in just a bit. Okay. Does it matter? how heavy or thick the paper is, or is it all about the surface in terms of getting a smooth? It's, it's shape. not, um, it's, it's about the, you, you can, if you're well practiced, you can leave just as nice a line on it with a uh, rough watercolor paper as you, other than the skipping between the bumps, you know, the, the nooks and crannies, as you can with the super softest, flattest, like vellum bristol, you know? It's, it's all in just, your practice of, of it, the hatching and stuff. All right, so see how with the background, there's cross hatching going all across kind of everywhere. There's still cross hatching in some of this. You can see like in here in this little neck area, I cross hatch, but I've tried to go with the actual kind of contour of the dog. So it went like this. And then I came down from there. I try to either follow the, the way the hair grows or follow the shape. Like with the muzzle, it's this way. With the muzzle, it's that way. It comes up like this to follow the shape of those highlights for that area. With the ears, that could be straight. So it just kind of depends. Now, um, there's another one that's done very similarly. You can see it much easier on the green. That's all cross hatching just to make kind of a neat little pattern. Um, and then there's cross hatching in here, but again, some of that follows the contour. So it, depending on the medium, I like this texture and it adds some character, but I also like it to not read as so much texture in here. So I will follow the contours. Now, one that I did that's all contour. This one's actually all contour. It's dark, so it's harder to see, but every single little stroke that's put on this all follows the contour of the face and shape and head. You can see 
even in here, there's little contours following kind of the lips. There's a gray, uh, can you see the white, the white gel pen? Uh, no, I don't think it picks up. There you go, maybe that works. I can't tell if this monitor. There's white gel pen here. This is just yeah, done. This is done on Yupo, so I liked how kind of the creamy milkiness it was, but it needed just a little bit of highlight to pop. So, and you can see in the ear here, that contoured actually instead of kind of just roughly following the ear like the other one, I actually contoured it up and out because this is white in here, but it's shaded on this Harlequin, so I followed it up and out. Um, Another one that shows the last one. I just brought. I, I've been working on these, so I just I thought I would bring them along. See how in the neck here, you can very much see the cross hatching, right? But it also follows. At first, I followed along with the regular hatching, how that kind of hair on the neck goes, and then when you do that, kind of the he, the mind reads that as the hair going that way. And then I do a very fast across, just kind of to give it almost a gray value. Um, and you can see in the face up here, some of that same stuff, some of it following contours, some of it just being kind of uh, almost adding as a gray value, right? Uh, I think in the ear, you can really see those little lines. So these are just, this is just drawing skills that I learned in pencil a long time ago, put into pen with just, I, I, I'm confident enough with it where I don't feel like I, I need to do draw it in pencil first and then, you know, erase it as I go. That's just line work that's done straight up pen. All right, does everybody want to see a little bit more hatching on this or do we want to skip to the next? You can ask them. Gonna take 30 seconds. That's fine. Okay. I get, then I've got 30 seconds more work to put in this. It's funny because strangely, I'm so used to not drawing in pencil because I colorize most stuff like those that it feels really strange to use a pencil for this. Oh, look, you can erase. When you're practicing your shading skills, mm -hmm. would you recommend using higher quality pencils or is it okay to just use a... Okay, so that would be, uh, that's a good question and people ask that a lot. And and I, uh, I, I so totally am there with you and I understand the need to use, um, you know, less expensive things to practice just in the hopes of it's a cost, right? Every time we buy an art supply, it's a cost. And if you're not selling work, it's, it's, got, it's a cost that may not be recovered. However, that would be like using a tiny little ball peen hammer to build a house with instead of a framing hammer or carpenter's hammer or something, you know, work, working on concrete and, and using that ball peen hammer instead of a sledgehammer to drive something in. It's always better to use the tool that's right for the job that you're comfortable with because even these pencils don't feel in my hand like other pencils that I might use. Um, so there's always that, this is, this is a thinner barrel than other pencils that I sometimes use. So it's always that adaptation to something that's new. So it's that many more variables that you have to control then for your practice drawing even, right? So then you go to your final drawing and then you're using something different and then there has to still be that that transition time. So, and, and pencils, you know what guys, these are the cheap things, you know, this isn't, this isn't, um, you know, a, a, a tube of, you know, lapis lazuli or something, oil paint that's, you know, $500. This is, these, these pencils, even an expensive graphite pencil is still going to be a few dollars to, to replace. So better to, to use the right tools up front. And this particular set of pencils is eleven ninety nine. Yes, and that gives you all your variations, which for for this line work, you don't need so much the variations. It's more the pressure that you're using, the the um, you know crossover of using it over and over to to darken it. 
but we will show something that will help with with when your when your darker ones and your lighter ones really do make a difference. Does everybody want me to move on to the next thing? Yes. Okay. All right. So we can see that that's starting to take shape with this. Just from these lines going, they're not as pronounced. I went slower. They're not as pronounced as down here. Um, you can see that that would kind of go in there and continue on. All right. So blending. Blending is the one thing that we all know because everybody smudged with their finger when they were in high school or something somewhere, right? But it's the one thing that we don't always necessarily do so well, right? And there is a technique to it. I'm going to go to, well, I'll just stick with the, it's just going to be really dark. I'll stick with the 4B. All right. So when you're, when you're using pencils, it's not just scribbling like that. You can do that, but these edges, when you start really pushing, start to get ragged, it's really hard to match them up. And blending is the technique where that's a lot more obvious. So it's like colored pencils. And I hate to tell people this because then they're like, it's going to take forever. Little circles, little circles, or even kind of ovals that gradually start filling in and making that solid color because what you're doing is you're controlling you're going slow enough where you're seeing okay I, i'm missing some parts so you can kind of softly go back in there and it's not leaving these hard ragged lines at first glance these almost look the exact same don't they but i can see this all looks the same very smooth value more like a paint just got laid down and this is very scribbly so you're going to want to my edge here so I can see it a little bit easier. You would just be going right into that. And because I know this is going to be dark, I'm going to just go ahead and make it nice and dark. And this is the one technique that's really hard to do from the side because it's very hard for me to I'm not up over it and the little bit of sheen with the graphite makes it really hard for me to see what I'm missing and what I'm not. Now I'm going faster than I would suggest you guys go, but I feel like I've got pretty good control over it. And this is where it's okay for this pencil point not to be sharp and it's okay to be breaking out these darker B pencils because this is where they truly flourish. This is where these pencils make absolutely perfect sense and are actually going to help you get your work done a lot faster because they deposit the graphite so quickly being so much more graphite and less clay. Okay, so see how that's, that's starting in on the shadow? So I'm going to take that and I'm going to go, I just want the shadow to be a little further out. I don't like how just weird shapey it is. That's a technical term, Katie, weird shapey. Hmm. Okay. Is there a good exercise to practice creating gradations in tone? Anything specific or? It would be practicing with drawing. Do some, you can draw some just very basic shapes that aren't going to take you a long time to, you know, base your drawing on, right? And then start practicing by shading it in. Do a still life, go to something like Pixabay and print off something super easy like this that, you know, and, and you don't have to worry about this drawing being the perfect shape and oh my God, it doesn't look like an egg and everybody's gonna know and that's a big pencil line just do them like this i just I, I i drew one and then went and traced them right and then practice on each of them a different style or practice because if it's practice you're not worried about this being perfect you're not worried about anybody seeing it just sitting and doing this to fill a sheet isn't the same as doing line work to fill a sheet like we did in some of those other um in some of those other episodes where we talked about kind of warming your hand up and things like that. This is, is you know, where it's okay to not have a finished drawing. Okay, I'm kind of trying to leave myself a little bit of space in here for that reflected highlight. 
Now, then what you do to really soften this and kind of almost burnish it isn't to put your hand on it and rub it because you don't want the oils from your hand on this paper. And I know that sounds silly. In printmaking, we, in college, we always had to leave huge borders around our, our uh, prints. It wasn't just for, okay, this is going to be the area that the mat will cover, so if your hands are a little dusty or dirty or whatever. It was, if that oil gets on that paper, you can't see it, but everybody just, it means everybody normally just sweats just a little bit or has a little oil on their hands before they start, no matter how much you wash your hands first. You will see those fingers and thumb prints depending on the paper and how oily or, you know, acidic your skin is two years, five years, 10 years later. So it's always better not to stick your finger on there and smear. It's better to use a blending stomp. Okay, you can see this. And, and probably I would be more comfortable with a bigger one. This is, um, this is just a nice little one that came in a set that I was gonna use something else on. But turning that kind of on its side and slowly kind of in that same circular motion, I'm going along and this is softening that and really blending it nice and smooth. If I wanted it to have that super softness on this, it's really gonna pick up because there's a lot more material. See, so look at how much that's coming off just that, that little bit. And now you would keep doing this. You could use as you go and go into these kind of lighter areas, like this is already too dark right here. So I would probably gently pull that back up. Then I would go into it with some of these lighter pencils to actually kind of make that go smoother and softer. I mean, this would still need to be darker because this is obviously a little bit lighter value than here. But does that make sense as far as how you start really controlling the pencil and, and applying it to do this type of blending? Is everybody good with that? Okay. All right. Rendering. Now, rendering is going to... Um, be where you can either do a drawing like that and use a, an eraser to pull your highlights out, or this is my favorite way to do this, and we've done a couple things oh, of it. Here. I'm only putting a little on, Katie, don't worry. Okay, this is graphite powder. This is Soho graphite powder, okay? Quickest way to get great, remember, mid-tones, mid-range tones, is to actually take graphite powder. I've already got my drawing down because I didn't want to lose that, right? And a very soft brush, either something like the goat hair, squirrel, uh, anything you've got, just you're not going to want to go use this in paint ever, ever, ever again mm -hmm. because graphite does not wash out very well. Okay, I'm kind of trying to get It was okay. off camera, so they actually didn't. <laughs> good, good, good. All right, now see how a couple swoops across with that? You can't see any, uh, at first you could kind of see the brush mark because some of it's a little a little grittier than, than other pieces. But I worked that into that paper fiber both ways, both ways, both ways. I usually do it two times up and down, two times back and forth, kind of almost like painting a wall, right? All right, so then and I'm gonna use the vanish eraser because I love the edge of this. Got my egg here. Rendering is where you're using, pulling your light values and highlights out with an eraser. So this is almost an additive and a subtractive method. I did the additive portion, right? It's almost like sculpture where I put that powder on and made it work. Now I'm going to come back across with my eraser. I'm gonna find the edge of this egg. So 
see where I'm pulling this across here. And down here, we've got this. Reflective shadow I would also pull that out there too and slowly start kind of working away from my shadow now you can use this type of eraser you can use something like the Marie's works the um, these are what the 4b erasers you can use um, even a uh, um, rubber the the gray ones we don't like on the show right Katie Mm -hmm. um, and that one is actually nice sometimes to kind of, huh? Ah. Pick out. This works much better when you've got it actually tied down, or you taped down. And again, this is helpful for even though we just use that. Yeah, most of the graphite out. Helpful for kind of pulling that eraser stuff back. Let me real quick put in our shadow so you can see where kind of the bottom of our egg is here. Now with this you could do any types of you could you could do hatching, you could do cross hatching, you could do blending with this if you wanted this to look super smooth. Um, my favorite thing to do with this when I do something uh, along these lines is I enjoy cross hatching with it because if you do it lightly enough and you do it with not the super dark B pencils, you can really start making your um, kind of next gray values pop, getting darker by adding a little bit of that. And because it's already in a nice medium tone here, you can't pick it up very easily. So people don't necessarily view it as, it's another good thing when you're doing this type of technique. I think when I did that elephant, Katie, I think I used, cleaned off half of the eraser on mm -hmm. the floor. I keep a piece of canvas. Gessoed is actually more helpful than regular, but just a textured material, but canvas is super ideal. Just to kind of get the dirty eraser guts off of it. Because it will start filling and there's no, if you keep going, it just, you can feel it starting to kind of just push it around. And I can put a link in the group later tonight of uh, when we did this with the elephant. Because that was what, one of the, that was one of the after parties for drawing, wasn't it? It seems like we did this with the, that elephant picture, Katie. I don't remember why it's been so long. Mm-hmm. I think it was last year. offhand if there's anything in that jar of graphite other than powdered graphite, some sort of stickative or something like that? No, it shouldn't be. It should just be powdered graphite only. There's not anything on the back of the packaging. Are they, are they worried about a, like something to dry, dry the graphite out and keep it dry or are they worried about... Okay. All right. So see how that's that's starting to kind of edge that out? And from there, um, I would actually probably use, to go to the lightest light, a stick eraser to chase that edge and kind of smooth it out. You can go back around and kind of give it a bit of a edging too. Just where it got a little bit uneven. Okay. Then you start working your values over here with your, with your pencil. You can kind of blend this into that where it's not as easy to see that kind of harder edge. Whether you want to use a blending stump to kind of work that back in, see how nice and soft that just made that or whether you just want to do line work and know that eventually it'll kind of pull that out. 
right on the edge of my egg. It's messing with my mind not being able to see it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what? It's just weird. Again, I'm, I get very ritualistic in what I like to have done first, so it's easier for me to kind of see that kind of whole form and go from there. All right, does this this make sense? Rendering? Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's just skip to the next. There's two more types, and we want to make sure we fit them in in time. Okay. All right. Now this one is just very fun and modern. I see a lot of illustrators use it, especially people that do like kids' books and stuff like that. Um, sharpen this pencil again. Well, gee, this is going to be like a stump by the end of the thing, right? I knew how much you actually sharpen pictures when sharpen pencils when you're doing stuff. Oh, I've I keep a uh, I've got a a pottery uh, pitcher that my brother-in-law made me for. Uh, watercolor water for my uh, work table at home. I use it for shavings. I love, I don't know what it is, it's like a pr really pretty blue like about this and I I love what the colored shavings for, from colored pencils look like yeah. in it. So yeah, that's, I'm, I'm weird, I've got my... Okay, so this is random lines. Loose free application. The pressure of how hard you push can help make dark lighter. The crossing of the lines, just like with the hatching, is going to be that what that frequency is of how often they cross is going to help determine your value. So random lines means you could just do swiggles and wiggles. It's just very loose and free. You can see where that's crossing. Sometimes I do it like this. I'll just almost like hatching, but I'll just do it rougher. Especially if I'm doing layout work, this is my go-to shading of choice because you can work so much faster because you're not worried about it all looking pretty and perfect. See how quickly you can get the impression down. Would you use ever use a an electric pencil sharpener? Uh, it depends on how good a quality it is because if it's not, it will take off a lot of your lead where you will lose a lot of valuable lead, especially with something like colored pencils. So um, it would need to be one with an auto stop that works super well and that goes slow enough where it's not going to like eat it away really fast. Um, I have an old one that I think was exacto made for a while and then I think they don't make it anymore because they've probably come out with something that, you know, is like the Ginzu knife. He slices and dices and cuts cans and opens your solvent lids you can't get or something, you know, who knows, pickle jars. But um, it actually works well enough where I will use it for graphite pencils, but I'm just always a big chicken about using that kind of stuff for my colored pencils. Okay, can we see how this is starting to... be looser and more open down here where we're just making those kind of lighter gray values and I you can see that I've turned the pencil on its side I'm I'm being very gentle and very soft because these are light values that I don't want I want it to read as you know starting to get darker but not horribly dark is this the same pencil now that you were using earlier with the cross hatching the very same one 4B. Let's see how quickly I can start. This is actually not the worst 
way to kind of just get your hand used to following form with these kind of random lines. Kind of, you're scribbling, but you're also, eh, I say that and then go off the freaking path right there. Now with these, you could probably burnish it if you wanted just as easily. Um, it would just, you know, keep in mind that because it's random, there's going to be spots where it's not going to be, you know, as dark or light as you might want it to once you start burnishing it because it'll work some darks into real dark and some into... Uh, you know, like little light pockets kind of. Can we see how quickly that builds? Ian would like to know, do you use a hand long point sharpened pencil or just a standard point on your pencil? No, I don't like the long points. I break, I'm too heavy handed and I break them really easy. It's a good question. I just, I don't, I don't trust the, the that much lead sticking out. And I've stabbed myself, Ian, <laughs> multiple times just because I tend to be bad about putting pencils and stuff in my mouth or brushes or, or whatever and I, I think I've stabbed myself actually in the lip before so with a super long point so I just don't don't even like them all right can we is everybody seeing kind of how this will let's try um, let's try burnishing it what do you do with your pencil shaping um like do you save them or anything there's no reason to save them because the wood's in with it. I mean, you could use them if you had like a wood boiler or something to help as kindling, but um, you know, you wouldn't want your face in by it in case anything's not good to breathe. See, that's, that's not so bad. That burnishes pretty nicely. So there's, there's always that. You can do that type of a technique for working a little faster and then kind of come back and control it some with uh, with that. Not so bad. All right. Okay, the last one is so much more fun in, in um, ink than it is in pencil because ink is so much easier to see. Stippling or pointillism, right? You're applying the drawing as a bunch of dots. You're building up, you're, the way you build value is by the proximity of those marks. Whether it's further away, it's going to be lighter. Whether it's closer together, it's going to be darker. The trick with this technique is not being heavy handed and not using your pencil on its side. You want it to just be that point because otherwise you'll start getting irregular shaped points as you go along and it starts calling attention to the ones that are irregular. With this kind of thing, you want people to read it as a whole. So the more kind of generic it is and all for one, the better. And you can see I started here. This is literally like seven minutes of, of points. So I'm just gonna go up here so you can kind of see This was our, our top. And I wanted this to be that nice dark value. And this is also something, it's really easier to have be up over it so that you're pushing straight down and can control it. When you're like this, I'm seeing irregular shape marks all around. And with pencil, with, with pens, the pressure isn't as obvious as with pencils. You can totally see like big marks, small marks, weird shaped marks because I'm not right over the pencil. Can you tell them what you use to burnish? I don't burnish. So, and, and, and that's not right or wrong. I just don't like it. I don't like things where it's got that airbrushed look. To me, it doesn't look handcrafted. It looks like this, which if you can take a photo and do this, or put a soft filter on a photo to make it look like a drawing and make it look burnished. I just personally, I like that little bit of line from hatching because it, I don't know, it just reads as more unique to me. And, and 
so and dynamic it's for me. just how weird I am because I used to put used uh, sculpture tools that had the ones that you use for cut carving it away and it leaves those little lines I liked to keep that in my clay sculptures too yeah. which once it's fired it's got that rough texture but there's something about that and I would do it like that the same thing with hatching and it's a sculpture why I was doing that I, I don't know but that's it's just my weird thing so um, if I was going to burnish something that's this is a very small point something that's a little bit bigger would be much easier to control and I would not be using as soft of a pencil right away because it being softer makes it a little bit harder to control overall so I would use um, some of the ones that are a little bit lighter first to really get that burnishing and then see how much I needed to get darker so all right hopefully I mean I don't know hopefully this has helped <laughs> It's, it's, you know, there's no, ex um, no, not excuse. I mean, there's a, always an excuse. We're all adults and we have lives. There's always an excuse not to practice. But there's, there's no substitute is the word I'm looking for, for practicing. And the better you get, the faster you are, the quicker you can knock shading out like this. And it's not such a, a mystifying, like, hocus pocus voodoo thing or uh, you know for for some people that that stresses out very easily they're in this camp over here then there's the other people that it's horribly boring and mundane and just this disgusting awful fact of drawing that shading needs to be done to make something look dimensional and they abhor it so you got these two camps and then there's weird people like me in between that like this is a zone thing that you get into and and I, I enjoy the control of the line to do shading. So, but that's also that I practiced it a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot through the years. So get into the zone and try some practice like this. I will put this, what do you think, Katie? Put this image up mm -hmm. so people can try this one. And then I also have a challenge image. Since I'm gonna be out of town next week, we're gonna have a show, they're gonna put it up, but it's not going to be live. I'm going to give you a challenge image for homework for next week of marbles to try to take and turn into value. You may do easier, do a little bit better if you take this and make it a black and white image in your computer, uh, but it's still okay to do it from color because if you're working from a still life, you'd have to be able to figure out how to, to change the value. But I will put those up by tomorrow at noon. Um, in the Jerry's live group on Facebook. If you're not in the group and you want to be, it's a great way to share your artwork and get feedback. People ask all sorts of cool questions. It's just a great community. Go to groups on Facebook, type in Jerry's live, make sure you answer the question because they won't approve you unless you do. And then you'll be able to get all these cool extras that we do sometimes where we do homework or reach challenges or things like that. You guys have a great week. And a great week next week. And I'll, I'll catch you on the flip side. Take care.